is, well, good afternoon, everyone. The matter before the court is Whidbey Environmental Action Network versus Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission, case number 21-2-329-34. This matter comes before the court on the petitioner's petition for judicial review, petition for writ of cert and complaint for declaratory judgment. Before the court invites argument from the parties, the court has been advised that certain media may be in attendance and in addition that media may wish permission from this court to record. If that's accurate, if there are any media members present who wish to record, please advise the court and I'll address each one of you individually. Is there any media present? Mr. Kunzler, 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 good afternoon. Okay, thanks. Any, uh, any other member who wishes to uh, record? Hi, Your Honor, I'm Courtney Flatts uh, with Public Radio and I was hoping to record the proceedings. Good afternoon, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Your Honor, I'm Hannah Ray Lambert with Coffee or Die Magazine and I wish to record the proceedings. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, it appears that the uh, petitioner will be um, represented this afternoon by Mr. Tolegan, maybe? Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, Your afternoon. Honor. This is Zach Griefen. Uh, Brian Telligen and I will be representing the petitioner with the Environmental Action Network. And who, Mr. Griefen, good afternoon to you. Who will be addressing the court on behalf of your client? I will, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. And who will be representing the respondent, uh, State of Washington, Parks and Rec? That would be John Heidinger, Assistant Attorney General for the State of Washington, Your Honor. Mr. Heidegger, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Do either of the parties have any objection pursuant to uh, Court Rule GR 16 to the request to uh, record the proceedings, starting first with uh, State Parks and Recreation Commission? No objection, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. No Griffin. objection, Your Honor. Thank you. The court will uh, allow video and audio recording and still photography by those people who have made that request. Uh, the record shall reflect that the individuals making that request on behalf of their respective agencies or organizations, or in the case of Mr. Kunzler, uh, potential viewers, are all appearing remotely. None of these individuals are physically present in court. Therefore, the um, possibility of disrupting the proceedings is nil. So the court has taken that into consideration in its decision making to allow uh, recording. And the court, for whatever this is worth, the court will add, just for purposes of the record, that this court, um, unlike other courts, does not really struggle with requests to record proceedings, um, especially in um, the era of the pandemic or uh, near post pandemic when it's difficult for individuals to physically uh, appear in court and um, in this era where there is a um, blurred line between what the legislature might consider media and what the public might consider media. And this court's not interested in drawing a distinction between um, those two groups of individuals. Thank you for indulging me in that regard. Uh, before the court invites argument from the parties, the court will advise the parties and will advise everyone else that the court has reviewed, for the most part, the entire record. The court appreciates the parties providing the court with um, the record electronically pursuant to the court's earlier order. Um, and I mentioned I've reviewed almost entire, the entire record. It's about 11,000 pages long, as I recall. Um, so I would be less than truthful if I said I looked at it all, but I looked at 
uh, a lot of it, and I've had ample opportunity to look at it. I've looked at it over the past few weeks while I've had access to it. So the court will hear first from Mr. Griefen, then the court will hear from Mr. Uh, Heidinger, and then the court will hear rebuttal argument from Mr. Griefen. I'll ask the parties to uh, limit their arguments to somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 minutes a piece or thereabouts. I'll try not to police you. I understand and appreciate that these are significant issues um, and the parties um, have many issues to discuss with the court. But I'll also uh, advise the parties again that I've reviewed the record and I've reviewed the pleadings um, submitted by the parties. So all of that in mind, Mr. Griffin, I'll hear from you, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. When the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission voted four to three to open up 28 public state parks to covert military training exercises, it acted beyond its power and violated the state's policy on the use of public park land that's found at RCW 79A.05.305. And under SEPA, the commission failed to adequately analyze the significant adverse effect of the proposal on the recreational use of state parks. That adverse effect was made clear to the commission by many hundreds of public comments. Commenters stated that military use of state parks would be intimidating and creepy and would cause them to stop using the affected parks or restrict the use that they made of them. Sue Ellen White is a declarant for WEEN, would be Environmental Action Network, our client, and she enjoys astrophotography, taking pictures of the sky at night. And when she camps in state parks at night, she wanders through the parks looking for the best shot. She also testifies about walking her dog at night and walking to the beach at night to observe bioluminescence in the water. These are the kinds of things, Your Honor, that state parks are for. But these activities could bring her into contact with military forces making amphibious landings on state park beaches or creeping through the woods carrying simulated weapons. She testifies uh, in her declaration that even if special forces personnel are successful in staying hidden, the knowledge that they could well be there and observing us is just plain creepy to me and traumatic to some family members. Elsewhere in her declaration, she describes a family member who suffers from PTSD for being stalked. Sue Ellen White will test, will, testifies that she will cancel her plans to visit and camp at several state parks this year, 2022, including Deception Pass, Fort Flagler, Fort Warden, Manchester, and Twin Harbor State Parks if the decisions commissions, uh, sorry, if the commission's decision stands and the Navy is permitted to go ahead with its military training. And that is awful, Your Honor. Sue Ellen's recreational use of state parks is what the parks are for. They are not for military training. There are many, many more comments in the record along these lines, as I, I'm sure you're aware. Lots of people do not want to visit parks with military training occurring in them. They would be displaced by the proposed military use. That's a significant adverse impact on recreation, even if the recreational users never see the so-called ninjas in the woods. And that's how the military or the Navy describes uh, its trainees itself, Your Honor. They, just, they state our training is to be essentially the ninjas. Military training is a strange kind of permit to issue in state parks. It has nothing to do with recreation or scientific research, or conservation, or any of the other public purposes that are outlined in the statute for state parks. It's not authorized by the statute from which the commission gets its duties and powers. The commission's action was ultra virus. It acted beyond its power, and that's our first claim. Our second claim is that covert military training will creep people out and deter them from using the state parks. The commission never adequately analyzed this deterrent effect on recreation under SEPA, and I'll treat each of these claims in turn. The commission's action was beyond its power, ultra vires. 
The commission styles itself as the owner of land and fee simple that possesses a bundle of sticks that it may distribute to whomever it pleases. It is not. The commission is a creature of statute with limited duties and powers. The commission's enabling statute declares the public policy of the state of Washington to be to set aside and maintain state park lands for public park purposes. But the commission avoids and ignores this statement of purpose. It never even cites that statement of purpose at RCW 79A.05.305 in its briefing. An administrative agency created by statute has, quote, only those powers expressly granted by the statute or necessarily implied therefrom. That's the Ortblad v. State case from 1975, 85, Wash 2nd, uh, 109. Here, does the statute give the commission the expressly given power to permit military use of state parks? No. Is that power necessarily implied from the powers and duties that are granted by the statute? Again, no. The test is, is the asserted power necessary to accomplish the statutory duty? That's been the law in this state for 100 years. In 1915, the state Supreme Court said that if a, I'm quoting, if a person or board is charged by law with a specific duty and the means by which that duty is to be accomplished are not specially provided for, the person or board so charged has the implied power to use such means as are reasonably necessary to the successful performance of the duty. That's State v. Clausen, a 1915 case, 84, Wash 279. Implied powers, Your Honor, are a means to an end, and the end is the statutory duty. This commission has no duty to open up recreational parks to military use. Instead, the statute is structured to state a general purpose, manage state park lands for public park purposes, and then it gives the commission a series of spe specific express grants of power in 79A.05.030 and 070. The commission says that 0 .030 and 0 .070 give it the authority to permit this military use. That's in item E1. That's the proposal that was uh, voted on four to three by the commission. It was attached to our complaint and it appears at administrative record 3.1-0113. But nothing in 79A.05.030 or 0 .070 grants or implies the power to permit military use of state parks. The closest grant might be in RCW 79A.05.070 sub 4, which states that the commission may, um, quote, act jointly when advisable with the United States in order to carry out the objectives and responsibilities of this chapter. But permitting military use of state parks does not carry out any objective or responsibility of the commission under 79A.05. This structure of necessarily implied powers was explicitly recognized by the legislature in this statute in RCW 79A.05. That statute at subsection 0 .070 sub 9 states that the commission may, quote, utilize such other powers as in the judgment of a majority of its members are deemed necessary to effectuate the purposes of this chapter. That's where the implied powers come from in this case, from 070 sub 9. And, not, and no one, not the commission, uh, argues that permitting military use of state parks is necessary to effectuate the purposes of chapter 79A.05. The commission twists this analysis around. For example, the RCW 79A 070 sub 5 provides an express power to grant franchises and easements. The commission argues that because it can grant franchises and easements, it can also permit the Navy to conduct military training on state park lands. 
it, uh, it alludes to this in its, in its briefing, and it's made very clear by the draft permit for Blake Island that's in the record at AR 4.10001, which says, this permit is granted under authority of RCW 79A.05.070 sub 5. But that section regards franchises and easements. This action is not a franchise or an easement, neither are the permits, nor does the power to grant franchises and easements necessarily imply the power to permit military training activity. The commission acted beyond any express or implied power in its decision to authorize permits for military use of state parks should be reversed and vacated under our constitutional claim. As to our SEPA claim, we argue that the commission violated SEPA uh, by failing to adequately analyze the deterrent effect on recreational use in state parks. The commission was well aware that citizens would be deterred from recreating in state parks if the commission permitted military use of those parks. There were many hundreds of comments to that effect. But the commission failed to analyze or consider this under SEPA. It failed to collect information or conduct a worst case analysis on this deterrent effect. And it also failed to employ so-called phased review, which means that you review on a broad project or programmatic level up front, and then you essentially do SEPA again when individual projects or site-specific actions are authorized, you do a more granular analysis then. You can either uh, analyze everything up front, which is the default, or you can analyze, you can break it up and do programmatic now and site-specific later. But the commission did neither of these, which means that the individualized site-specific effects on particular parks and the users of those parks will never be analyzed under SEPA. Now, the commission will argue that there are no such effects that its conditions cure this deterrent effect. But the commission is wrong. The purported prohibitions on surveillance and daytime training are illusions. And we, in our opening brief, we point out that special forces would be authorized to train within the state parks for up to 72 hours at a time. How can the commission say that training will be prohibited during the daytime when the trainees remain in the park hiding from the public during the day? Hiding during the day is part of the training. The commission never addressed this in its response. And the purported nighttime restriction in any event can be lifted at the sole discretion of the director in less than a year with no further SEPA review. As to the surveillance of the public condition, it, it, the plainclothes naval personnel will be circulating among the recreating public surreptitiously observing them, monitoring their movements so that they may intervene in the event of imminent detection of a trainee. Your Honor, military forces secretly observing members of the public are surveilling the members of the public. And we know that under those kinds of conditions, people will act differently. As one court put it, we act differently when we believe we are being observed. If we can never be sure whether or not we are being watched and listened to, our actions, all our actions will be altered and our very character will change. That was a New York case citing uh, Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Um, we, uh, we, we made a mention to the idea of the panopticon in our, our briefing and uh, it gets a little off into the realms of philosophy, but I'm happy to address it later if the court desires. Many citizens commented and all of our declarants testify that they will avoid these 28 parks altogether if the commission's action stands. That's a real probable significant adverse effect on recreation. Commission will argue that it doesn't need to analyze that because SEPA is not concerned with what they call intangible, subjective and indirect impacts, but they're wrong. The SEPA checklist as to recreation asks about displacement of recreational uses. It doesn't ask why the recreational uses were displaced, what led to them. It, it wants the commission or what any agency to assess displacement of recreational uses. And SEPA explicitly 
requires consideration of subjective and indirect impacts. Aesthetics, for example, are subjective. And a proposal's effects, quote, include direct and indirect impacts caused by the proposal. That's from the SEPA regs at WAC 197-11-060. So there's two ways in which the commission failed to comply with SEPA, besides the overarching failure of just not analyzing this effect at all. The first way is that they failed to conduct the worst case analysis that's required by WAC 197.11.080. That reg says that if information necessary to a reasoned choice is lacking, the agency has to try to get it. If it can't get that information because there's no way to get it or because it would be an exorbitant cost to get it, then the agency must disclose the lack of information and it must prepare a worst case analysis and a likelihood of occurrence of that worst case. The agency did none of those things here. The commission says, well, how would we? How would the agency quantify when the deterrent effect constitutes a substantial adverse impact under SEPA? That's in their reply brief at page 19. They should ask the public. The commission has a system for ongoing visitor surveys of both day use and overnight customers. That is the commission's own way and own strategy of providing the public with experiences they want and expect. And asking recreational users in this way does not turn the issue into some kind of popularity contest. If the proposed use of state parks is immensely unpopular with the recreational users of those parks to the point where they will stop visiting those parks altogether, that's relevant to the determination of whether the impact is adverse, significant, and probable. Second, and finally, the commission failed to employ the procedures for phased review that are required under SEPA. SEPA pro prohibits and forbids piecemeal review of projects. Projects that are related to each other closely enough to be in effect a single course of action shall be evaluated in the same environmental document. That's from WAC 197.11.0603. Now the commission admits in briefing that, it's, uh, that this overall programmatic approval and the subsequent individual permits for specific parks are, quote, in essence, a singular action. Well, then, under the SEPA regs, the individual site-specific permits should have been considered in the mitigated determination of non-significance. Or, failing that, they should have been considered later during phased review. As I mentioned, phased review is essentially doing SEPA twice, once at the broad level, once at the granular site-specific level. The war games that are proposed for individual state parks at specific times and places are, will, will generate impacts that are site-specific and time-specific. SEPA explicitly recognizes that, quote, the same proposal may have a significant adverse impact in one location, but not in another location. But the commission never analyzed the impacts of this military use in particular locations at particular times, nor did it provide for that analysis later. In failing to do that, the commission violated SEPA and the mitigated determination of non-significance should be reversed and vacated. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Heidinger? Thank you, Your Honor. My name is John Heidinger and I'm the Assistant Attorney General and may it please the court, I will go directly into my argument. The first issue as brought up by opposing counsel was the commission's statutory authority to allow the Navy's transitory training proposal. As opposing counsel stated, the state agency has the, the powers that expressly granted by statute or necessarily implied therefrom. So if we take a look at section 05, 030, and 070, that gives the commission broad statutory authority over the care, charge, control, and supervision of all parks and parkways acquired or set aside by state parks for park or parkway purposes, including the authority to adopt policies pertaining to the use, care, and administration of state parks and parkways. 
the polling council mentions that we did not bring up section 05305. If we look into this, that came into existence in 1984. The session law shows that that was strictly tied to the removal of, and harvest of timber in, in the state parks. That in no way did that add any kind of additional conditions or restraints on state parks. It does mention policy, and that policy is similar to that which is in 05030. So there's nothing in any of the legislation that specifically prevents state park from doing or granting these kind of permits. As pointed out in our briefs, if we take a look at this idea of all the powers expressly given or implied therein, we have an express grant the ability to issue a lease, which is a right of use and exclusive possession. Under that, we have the right of an easement, which is a right to enter and use, but not possession. And state parks can grant that for any legitimate purpose, as outlined in 05070 section five. What we're here to talk about today is a permit, which is more akin to a license, which is a lesser form of an easement. While there is no definition of license or permit that is used in the statute, if you take a look at WAC 35232300, that speaks to easements, franchise, license, and permits. While that's not a statutory grant of power, it does express Park's understanding of its authority and how it's been that way since about 1984. So what we're looking at here is that implied authority, and that is that um, the legislature gave state parks express permission to go for, for an example, three blocks down, go all the way to go all the way to a, uh, a lease under such conditions as shall be approved by the commission. And it can go two blocks down for an easement, which is for any legitimate purpose. We're here to discuss whether or not state parks have the authority to go one block down and issue a permit. And in order to get to an easement, to get to that block two, you have to walk past block one. So it's implied therein. The constitutional writ is a very narrow, it requires a very specific look at this case and the court's review is very narrow. The party challenging agency decision carries a burden to demonstrate that the decision was so clearly illegal that it calls for revision by constitutional writ. In this case, there's nothing been prevented, nothing presented that shows that this was a clearly illegal decision. Ween's next argument goes into the SEPA review. And in this case, the SEPA review was conducted based on the Navy's original proposal, that being a daytime and nighttime training exercises. That review was then applied to each of the parks in question. So at this point, Wien goes, Wien skips over the, the MDNS and skips directly to the Section B Part 12 mitigating conditions. Now, in order to address that, we need to address this idea of a nomenclature, and that is parks addressed indirect impacts, where those indirect impacts or environmental, ad, probable adverse environmental impacts under SEPA. What we're looking at here in this idea of this creep factor is a speculative sort of impact. And in fact, parks is not required to address those kind of impacts as an impact under SEPA. You can see that in section 4A. And in fact, this idea of this creep factor is not even under the definition of environmental when looking at a probable adverse environmental impact. Even though State Parks was not required to address this creep factor as part of its SEPA review, it did through all the public comments that were presented and those public comments helped shape the MDNS and the mitigating conditions that were brought forth. In fact, the first mitigating condition is surveillance of members of the public is prohibited. So Ween's argument that in some fact that the Navy would be hanging out and just sleeping in the bushes or whatever is, it's a non-factor. In fact, they mentioned the 72 hour period. That 72 hour, hour period is a range. It does not mean that the Navy will be there for 72 hours. For the first nine months, all the training is required to fall under the nighttime use only. And that doesn't mean that they can be there through, during the day when the nighttime is over, they leave. 
in nine months, that may be lifted by the director, but in those times, it doesn't make a difference to the SEPA analysis. In fact, every park has been addressed through the included maps, which at this time are still being finalized. But those maps apply the mitigating conditions to each and every one of the parks through the Navy's proposal. There will also be no displacement of recreational activities. If we look back to the mitigating conditions, you can see that from uh, the public will not be excluded from any area that is otherwise open to the public. And no trains may occur if there is an existing public presence. In fact, if any member of the public was to stumble upon this area, be it at night, during the day, at any time, the Navy will be forced to pick up and move to another location or cease training altogether. And at this point, I think we need to point out that there will be no plainclothes officers mingling amongst the public or you know, surveilling them in any fashion. That issue comes from the fact that there may be plainclothes Navy personnel posted at access points for safety purposes. That way, if a member of the public was to stumble upon the training area, they could intervene and sit, let them know what's going on and say, excuse me while we pack up and we get out. So there is no situation where the people will be actually intermingling. And in fact, the Navy's permit is based on getting in and getting out without leaving any sign. So there will be no adverse impact. In fact, the impact of the Navy's training is so transitory, it will likely be less than say a wedding. If you think of a wedding permit, they'll come in, they set up a wedding in an area where the public is normally allowed to be. And you can't just walk up and say, oh, I'm here. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to move this wedding. If someone was to stumble upon where the Navy is training, the Navy would have to pick up and leave and give right to the individual that is going to be there. So, so to uh, allow what petitioners ask in this court, in fact, turn SEPA from a scientific analysis into a popularity contest. In fact, as opposing counsel just stated, their idea of determining whether or not this should be, you know, something that is okay is to ask people which answer is more popular. And in fact, that is why something as speculative as this is outside of that SEPA analysis. In conclusion, the legislature was clear that it wanted to give parks the broad statutory authority to manage and use state parks land. It's under this authority that state parks delegated to the director the ability to issue these permits, which then went through a thorough SEPA review. Uh, to get back to that SEPA review really quickly and address a couple other points, the first is this idea of a phased approach. A phased approach, again, would be, as opposing counsel already stated, the, a wrong idea in this case. In this case, there is, we would be, if we did a phased appro approach, the phased approach would be just piecemealing this idea out for the purpose of piecemealing it out. Every single one of the parks was reviewed individually for daytime, nighttime use. The maps were generated to apply those mitigating conditions to each and every one of those parks. There's gonna be no change between now and when those permits are issued that would require any further break or review that would otherwise be piecemealing this out for the sake of piecemealing. If we look at the worst case scenario, that is to be used if information on significant adverse environmental impacts essential to a reasonable choice among alternatives is not known. In this case, the record reflects that the SEPA analysis was done based on all of the required adverse probable environmental impacts as well as all the information taken in through public comment on this creep factor. So even though it wasn't required, it was still taken in. So there is no, there is no information that was not known at the time the SEPA was done. And it's also amongst a reasonable choice of alternatives. In this case, the MDNS reduces the probable adverse environmental impacts to as close to zero as possible. As such, there is no alternate, um, alternate to choose from. So in this case, state parks grant is grant is delegates to the director the ability to grant these permits under its broad statutory authority that the legislature left broad for a reason. If this idea of a philosophical difference or a creep factor is important, that is something that should be handled through the legislative process. The legislature could then go back 
and apply as we is requesting some kind of limitation specifically on Navy or military training. Until that point, the, the commission has the ability to grant these sorts of permits. The SEPA review took in all the required information for all adverse environmental impacts and took in the information about the factors of being philosophically different or creeped out by it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Griffin, rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Briefly, um, the uh, counsel for the commission stated, uh, misstated the law of implied powers. He was talking about, well, you walk past block one and you walk past block two and, and, uh, and you've already gone past those. So, you, you know, you, uh, I, I may have misunderstood it. I mean, misstated his analogy there with walking past blocks, but he's saying that if you have a greater power, you have all the lesser powers too, whatever they may be that any lesser power, if you've already been granted this broad authority, any less broad authority is automatically included. And that's just not true. You have to look at the asserted power that the court, that the agency uh, wants to uh, utilize and tie it back to its duties under the statute. Is it necessarily, is it necessarily implied? It's not a question of the, the large contains the small. It's a question of, is this thing that we want to do expressly authorized by the statute? If not, is it necessarily implied by the statute? Um, because it serves the statutory purpose. In the, in the case law, it, it's necessarily implied because uh, you could not accomplish your statutory duty without this power that hadn't been specified. So we just, the, the, they're misstating that law of necessarily implied powers. Under the um, 72 hours, uh, that's the first we've heard is, is now that, uh, that trainees won't be uh, in the park during the day and the record is replete with statements to the contrary. That that uh, that the trainings take place uh, up to seventy two hours at varying locations in these state parks, and um, uh, you know I, I I'm not sure we should uh, take a lawyer's uh, statement about what the what item E one says um, over what item E one says, which is that trainings will last for seventy two hours at a time. And then um, the, the, uh, Mr. Heidinger uh, referred to various maps and said, we've, we've looked at these very closely. Uh, we did look at individual parks. We did um, analyze this all at the outset, but as we pointed out in our briefing, they did not, or if they did, they didn't do it adequately. So for instance, um, the commission in its briefing says that Maps showing the designated area for each park can be found in section 3.4 of the administrative record and that each park has a specifically designated training area and in every case, the training area is only a portion of the total park. Well, as we pointed out in our briefing, that's not true for at least Joseph Whidbey State Park. Joseph Whidbey State Park shows that the allowed training area is coextensive with the entire park. And Joseph Wisby has a campground on it, an overnight accommodation that's not shown on the map, nor is there any exclusion around it. We expect that there's other errors like this um, in the analysis because they really didn't do an individualized analysis of specific parks. Uh, in another case, they refer to a, uh, a page of the AR that, um, that that shows that they did an individualized analysis and that page of the AR is missing. There's just no such page. And if you look at the prior page, in fact, the several prior pages, all they are is an aerial view of an area of land with the outline of the park shown on it. Uh, that's, that's hardly the site-specific individualized analysis that's required under SEPA. And finally, Your Honor, uh, the counsel for the commission said, well, there is no other alternative. 
we've reduced this down as much as it can with our mitigated conditions. So there is no, he said there is no alternative. But there's a no action alternative. The alternative is not to permit military use of state parks, secret military use of state parks. Um, and uh, the, the commission, you know, had that alternative and had it availed itself of the no action alternative, it wouldn't have violated the law. Thank you. Thank you. Court's ready to rule. That issue is the January 28, 2021 decision of the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission, wherein that commission delegated authority to staff to issue permits to the United States Navy for use of state parks for training and its decision to allow staff to allow the lifting of certain limitations previously imposed although it appears to this court that that decision was never reduced to writing. I, as I recall, that was a verbal decision made by the commission. I didn't see it anywhere uh, in writing. And lastly, the court is asked to review the uh, decision of the commission with respect to the State Environmental Policy Act mitigation, mitigated, pardon me, determination of non-significance. Article four, section six of the state constitution grants this court the authority to review administrative decisions. This court must decide whether a writ of cert should issue in the event the commission had lacked jurisdiction and authority to make the determination or determinations it did. Here, more specifically, the court is asked to consider whether state parks acted or the commission acted within its statutory authority in authorizing its director to permit the use of state parks by United States military for training purposes. And secondly, did state parks properly and completely or adequately conduct a SEPA review? The starting point in the court's analysis is the statutes at, at issue and starting with RCW 79A.05.305, which provides the legislative policy relating to public recreational lands. That statute provides in relevant part, quote, dot, 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 it is the continuing policy of the state of Washington to manage lands within the state for public park purposes. To comply with these purposes, the lands shall be managed to maintain and enhance ecological, aesthetic, and recreational purposes, preserve natural resources, protect historical resources, provide recreational opportunities, preserve and maintain habitat, and encourage public participation in formulation and implementation of park policies and programs. So that's the starting point here uh, in this court's analysis. You look at the purpose of, or the policy of the state of Washington as it relates to public lands and public parks. And that's from the legislature, it's not from the court. Similarly, RCW 79A.05.600 provides the legislative policy relating to seashore conservation areas. And that statute provides in part beaches bounding the Pacific Ocean, provide the public 
with almost unlimited opportunities for recreational activities. The number of people wishing to participate in recreational activities grows annually. annually. This increasing public pressure makes it necessary that the state dedicate the use of beaches to public recreation and to provide certain recreational and sanitary facilities. Non-recreational use of the beach must be strictly limited. Recreational uses must be regulated in order that Washington's unrivaled seashore may be saved for our children in much the same form as we know it today. Pretty strong words from the legislature. That sets the framework for what public, what Parks and Recreation Commission shall bear in mind in its decision-making policies. Do they have the authority to manage and regulate public parks and beaches? Yes. But in this court's opinion, that authority must be viewed and analyzed in the framework, within the framework of the policy set by the legislature that the court um, just reviewed. RCW 79.05.010, which is cited by and referred to both parties in their arguments and in their briefings at subsection four provides recreation means those activities of voluntary and leisure time that aid in promoting, aid in promoting entertainment, pleasure, play, relaxation, or instruction. That's what recreation is defined as by the legislature. RCW 79.05.020 and .030 respectively set forth the mandatory duties and powers of the State Parks and Recreation Commission. Those mandatory duties include care, charge, control, and supervision of parks and parkways, set aside, I'm going to slow down because this is important in this court's analysis, set aside by the state for park purposes, adopt policies and enforce rules pertaining to the use, care, and administration of state parks. And there are uh, a handful of uh, other mandatory duties and responsibilities of the commission, none of which are relevant in the instant case. There are additional powers and duties of the commission that include, but are not necessarily limited to managing timber, applying conservation practices, designating certain forest areas as preserves, the authority to remove certain trees if they are hazardous, maintain roads, easements, et cetera. Those additional powers and duties are found in RCW 79A.05.035.
there are several other discretionary powers and duties afforded the commission, including but not limited to those duties found in 79A.05.055, which include the study of recreational needs of the state provide publication and sale of interpretive materials, and interestingly enough, and I'm looking at this for the first time, 79A.05.055 subsection 3, quote, coordinate the parks and recreational functions of various state departments, and I'll emphasize the last clause of this sentence and cooperate with state and federal agencies in the promotion of parks and recreational opportunities. Contracting with the United States military to conduct training exercises is not coordinating with government agencies to promote parks and recreational opportunities. In fact, the opposite is true. RCW Subsection four provides as an additional, or in this case, more specifically, further power of the Director of Parks and Recreation, its authority to, quote, act jointly when advisable with the United States, dot, 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 in order to carry out the objectives and responsibilities of this chapter, close quote. Now, a close parsing of that statute leads to only one conclusion, and that conclusion is that this court, nor the commission for that matter, should review that authority uh, piecemeal. Rather, this court and the commission should review that statute as a whole. And the second clause of that statute includes the requirement that the director act, quote, in order to carry out the objectives and responsibilities of this chapter, close quote. And the court started its analysis by referring to the objectives and policies of the statute, which are found, again, in RCW 79A.05.305. In short, the statutory duties and powers, both mandatory and discretionary, are set forth by the legislature in some detail. In this court's analysis and review, all of those duties and powers are centered around the protection and enhancement of public parks and lands. Nowhere in the statutes may it be implied that the commission has the authority to authorize military training. Certainly, it just simply does not exist. Again, circling back 
to RCW 79A.05.305, the policy of the legislature is to manage lands for public park purposes. The statutes at issue and that have been discussed uh, by this court must be read and interpreted as a whole, bearing in mind the overriding and clearly defined policy from the legislature. It also occurs to the court that had the legislature intended to grant authority to the Department of Parks and Recreation to enter into contracts with the United States military or any other entity or agency for that matter, it could have done so. It simply did not. And it would be error for this court to interpret the statutes to conclude that there was some implied authority conferred upon parks and recreation that would allow them the discretionary authority to enter into contracts with a government agency for the purpose of conducting military training. It's not even a stretch. It just does not exist, either in real words or by implication. So the court finds, and I'll get to this more specifically in a moment, that the Parks and Recreation Commission act, acted outside its statutory authority. Its decision was ultra vires. More on that in a moment. With respect to the argument uh, related to the State Environmental Policy Act, this court, um, this court finds it is not necessary for the court to make a ruling on whether the commission's decision, or it might be argued uh, lack of decision or faulty decision violated SEPA. I'm gonna make that uh, uh, decision regardless. This court does not believe it's necessary for the court to rule on that, but this court is fully aware that uh, a court, another court might be reviewing this court's decision and might disagree with this court. And it's a, in its decision and analysis with respect to whether the Parks and Recreation Commission exceeded its statutory authority. So that being said, this court will also rule that even if a reviewing court disagrees with this court on the first issue, whether the uh, commission act, acted outside its statutory authority, the court will also find that the uh, decision made by the State Parks Commission violated the provisions set forth in the State Environmental Policy Act. The State Environmental Policy Act requires state agencies to assess potential impacts of decisions regarding the environment. If such impacts might be significant, an environmental impact study must be conducted. If no probable significant adverse impact, if there is no probable significant adverse impact in the eyes of the agency, then the agency issues a determination of non-significance. The agency may also ultimately issue a mitigated determination of non-significance, setting forth requirements or imposing conditions that would result in reducing environmental impacts to non-significance. That's what the agency did in the instant case. Ultimately, they issued a mitigated determination of non-significance. This threshold decision requires the agency to uh, either conduct an environmental impact study or make a determination of non-significance or a mitigated determination of non-significance. Regardless, it is critical that the agency has the obligation to consider relevant environmental factors in a manner to sufficiently comply 
with SEPA requirements. The agency must conduct its analysis thoroughly, methodically, and it must be well documented. If potential impacts are unknown or if the costs associated with identifying and quantifying those impacts are difficult, impossible, cost exorbitant, the agency then must provide a worst case analysis per Washington Administrative Code 197-11-080 subsection three. The standard of review of uh, SEPA decisions is, quote, clearly erroneous, close quote. This court finds that the agency's SEPA analysis was clearly erroneous. The agency did not analyze what is referred to by the petitioners here as um, the, quote, creep factor, close quote. Now, over the past few days, this court has spent some time uh, trying to articulate another uh, definition or phrase that might adequately describe um, the emotional impact of people who utilize our state parks, something other than, quote, creep factor, close quote, because that's a long way from a legal term. But I can't find one. It is creepy. And the argument that, uh, look, judge, look, court, no harm, no foul, in this court's analysis falls on deaf ears. The fact is that the public has been advised that the military will be using state park lands to conduct military training. That fact and that fact alone creates a significant environmental impact. Will people use the parks knowing that the military is going to be there? And especially, I was thinking about this the other day as I was driving to work, especially in light of a couple of things that have happened in our world. January 6, 2021, for instance. I'll be very careful about what I say and what I don't say here, but these are difficult political times, challenging political times. And it begs the rhetorical question, of what might happen or what impression a park user might have if she or he stumbles upon military training in state parks. And now, of course, with the benefit of, of benefit or non-benefit of additional time that has elapsed since the commission made the decision it made last January, still significant. What's going on in Eastern Europe right now where a government is conducting in a light most favorable to that government, military exercises in a light not most favorable to that government conducting a war. What might be the impression of a park goer when a park goer sees somebody in military garb on state park lands? It boggles the mind at least my mind. The argument is made that it's not significant, these potential impacts, and that it's not environmental. This court disagrees. These are very significant. They do impact the recreational use or perhaps non-use of 
park goers, it is clear to this court that people, I'm not going to say citizens of our state because that's not fair, just people might not use the parks if won't use the parks if the military is conducting training. It also, not that it's important in this court's analysis, but it also is not lost on this court that uh, I don't know how many hundreds of miles of coastland coast land and non-park land is available to the military to conduct their training exercises. I think that issue was raised uh, at the hearing below and the response was, well, that's true, but we need, we, the military, it's important to the military's training to conduct its training in a way that uh, individuals are actually at the park. Now that, uh, Uh, I, that is an example of a significant environmental impact. Which was not taken into consideration, circling back to the, the analysis the court must conduct, um, does uh, 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 that type of analysis or that factor in it, uh, that factor alone was not considered, certainly not adequately, certainly not thoroughly, certainly not methodically by uh, the commission when it issued its um, mitigated determination of non-significance. In other words, when the commission ultimately ruled that these concerns, potential environmental concerns can be mitigated by um, imposing certain conditions and restrictions on the military in its use. Um, in, in this court's opinion and conclusion that was, that type of decision was um, short-sighted, it was incomplete, it did not take into consideration the full impact uh, and gravity of the environmental impact at issue. And to take it one step further, even if it was difficult, if not impossible, for the commission to quantify or analyze that environmental factor the, under the uh, SEPA provisions in the Washington Administrative Code, as I've cited earlier, it is incumbent upon the agency to uh, prepare what is referred to as a worst case scenario. They didn't do that. So uh, this court also finds that the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission violated um, the uh, provisions set forth in the State Environmental Policy Act that the decision was uh, clearly erroneous. So the court uh, finds and rules that the commission decision to allow training operations in state parks violates the purposes and the duties of the um, parks and uh, recreation set forth in RCW 79.05. It is a violation of their limited authority to allow the use of state parks for non-park purposes. The decisions made by uh, the commission were arbitrary and capricious. They exceeded the statutory authority conferred by the legislature. 
Accordingly, the court grants the declaratory judgment in favor of the petitioner. The court further rules that the commission's mitigated determination of non-significance does not comply with the substantive and procedural requirements of the State Environmental Policy Act. The proposed training operations are likely to have significant adverse impacts that were not considered or not appropriately and fully and carefully considered by the commission. There was no worst case analysis conducted in the event the commission were to find that the impacts were difficult to determine. Pursuant to RCW 34.05, this court finds and concludes that the actions and decisions at issue are outside the statutory and uh, statutory authority and jurisdiction of the commission. The commission's actions were accordingly illegal. They were not supported by substantial evidence and were arbitrary and capricious. This court rules that the commission's order is reversed. It is vacated. The mitigated, mitigated determination of non-significance is vacated. The petitioner is entitled to costs and attorney's fees. The court uh, will ask the prevailing party, in this case, the uh, petitioner to draft a pleading uh, that is consistent with this court's ruling and to circulate that to Mr. Heidinger for his uh, review. Of course, the state of Washington need not agree uh, and presumably does not agree with this court's ruling. That being said, if the parties agree with respect to the language to be included in the order that the language comports with and is consistent with this court's ruling, an order can be presented to this court for the court's consideration on an ex parte basis. In the alternative, if the parties disagree with respect to the language to be included in an order, please draft respective proposed orders, file them with the court and note this matter for presentation. Mr. Griffin, any questions from your client? Your Honor, in drafting the proposed order, uh, would there be time to obtain a transcript of the hearing and review it uh, so that we accurately capture what Your Honor has stated here today? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Heidinger, any questions from your client? No, Your Honor. The court uh, wishes to extend its appreciation to both parties uh, for their extensive briefing and their uh, professionalism and their oral arguments to the court this afternoon. Thank you to the two of you. The court is off the record and in recess.